So, you know, trying to market to this, this ultra luxury brand at, a, at an extremely affordable price, you know, there's a lot of things that you have to overcome and educate people on, which can make it very, very difficult to actually try to do marketing um, during this process. You know, during Kickstarter, people care about the story. They take time to learn. They keep time to, you know, to really get to know what they're what they're investing in. They're, they're investing in a company, not just a product. Outside of that, people just want to buy a pair of shoes. Welcome to Sales Founders the entrepreneur's podcast for accelerating sales growth. Join us as we interview VCs, entrepreneurs, and industry experts to explore strategies that will help you conquer the sales gap and generate scalable revenue. Here's your host, Brad Harker. Hello and welcome to Sales Founders. I'm your host, Brad Harker. It is great to be with you again this week. Thank you for taking a few minutes to join us on the podcast. If you're new to the episode or you're new to the podcast, we welcome you to the show and invite you to come check us out at salesfounders.com. It's a great way for you to see past episodes. We have covered a lot of topics, uh, all focused on entrepreneurs seeking sales growth and traction. Um, also last week, if you haven't listened to that episode yet, we had Roy Morjohn from Inventus Partners talking about product validation and the life cycle of a startup. It's a great episode to kind of give some insight into all things product development, validation, crowdfunding, and long-term sales growth. Um, and relative to this week, you know, this is one of those episodes where we are talking with entrepreneurs that are in the mix. They are in the process right now. In fact, a quick thanks and shout out to Chris Russell of GSD Capital for the introduction and the recommendation. Um, but it reminds me episodes like this that, you know, I, like you, um, am an entrepreneur and I'm constantly finding those pivots and those opportunities to accelerate my sales growth and to do the things and create more value, re expand my audience. And so it's inspiring. I look forward to these episodes because there is so much relevance to the things that each of us are doing. And it reminds me of how grateful I am and how much I look forward to these podcasts each week. Uh, it's the highlight of my week and because I, I know and I hope that it's helping you in your journey as an entrepreneur. And I hope that this episode today is one that can inspire you and give you um, another tool or maybe a few strategies to make your journey a little bit more successful. So thank you for your support. But let's get to it. And this week I am joined by both Paul Farrago and Julian Gonzalez, and they are Ace Marks, a brand of handcrafted Italian dress shoes that is leveraging a direct to consumer model to disrupt one of the most established industries. In the past year alone, Ace Marks has sold in more than 80 countries and through Kickstarter, they have become the world's most funded footwear project. Uh, beyond their amazing shoes, Ace Marks is the first and only luxury brand that will buy back its shoes and donate them to help men get back on their feet and re-enter the workforce. So a really powerful mission behind an incredible brand. So on this episode, a couple of things that I think really stand out to me that I think can create value for you. Number one is we're going to talk about leveraging that domain experience, your expertise to disrupt even the most established industries and some of the technology and opportunities that are available in entrepreneurship today um, to make that even more possible. We're going to talk about how Ace Marks has broken all of the crowdfunding rules, including everything we've talked about on this show, to become the most funded footwear project. We'll talk about working with influencers, and we're going to talk about why they're focused on their customer experience. That's number one for them. As they have considered life after crowdfunding, how are they maintaining their sales growth and why are they putting everything into customer experience as the key to their long-term growth? This is a great episode and two entrepreneurs that are right in there with every single one of you. So without further ado, I'm excited to turn it over to Paul and Julian. Guys, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. Thank you. Uh, this is exciting. It's fun to have a couple, uh, you know, Co-founders, two guys in the call, uh, two different views of the company. It adds an exciting dynamic. But maybe just to kick things off and get us started, give us some history of Ace Marks and maybe just kind of the back your background and the things that have kind of led us to the point that we are at today. Absolutely. So I actually I'm a second generation shoe guy. Um, I was born into a shoe family. I spent a lot of my my younger years in Italy watching. Uh, spending a lot of time in factories with my family, my parents, watching them make shoes, watching the craftsmen work on shoes. And so I've kind of always been in, in the business or in some part of this business. And to make an extremely long story short for your listeners, a few years ago, um, I realized that there's a huge 
uh, disconnect really between the price that people are paying for high-end luxury shoes and the value that they're actually getting. So having a lot of a lot of contacts and having had a lot of experience in Italy, I knew that I can offer something significantly better at a at a much better price point and a much better uh, offering a much better service and just an overall experience to the customer. So that's really when I set out to to create the shoes and create the what what actually eventually became Ace Marks. Okay, um, and that's really where it all started. Just just that idea of it, putting connecting the dots of what my experience was and and what, what I was able to do with that. Okay, so a couple of questions about that. Um, number one, I mean, shoes, you know, I mean, style in general. I mean, this has been big business for, you know, for a long time. It's not like we're talking about a technical, you know, innovation here. Um, what were some of the main challenges or maybe what are some of the reasons you think that that is the predominant issue in the industry? I think that one of the, the I was in a little bit of a unique position. And I think that once the idea started coming to me, it kind of just unfolded. And I started, started seeing that I was able to connect a lot of the dots very easily. Um, so, so that's why I think that one of the reasons that we've been able to be successful, one of the things that's very different about the shoe business is that a lot of it is very relationship based. And okay. again, just having those relationships gave me a little bit of a leg up um, and being able to maintain those relationships. So I, I think that 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 gave us a little bit of an advantage uh, going into it. And we're definitely not the, f- the first company to make shoes. Um, like you said, it's been happening for thousands of years. But again, I think that people really um, very early on, especially through the through the use of crowdfunding through our Kickstarter campaign, we're able to see uh, that we really are creating something a little bit different, creating a value, and that our focus wasn't really just on the product. It had a lot more to do also with with the customers, creating community, and creating. Um, I don't want to. I don't like using necessarily the word brand because that does happen, but. Again, just more of like a global community that that shares like a common interest in really wonderful, beautiful product and particularly shoes. Yeah. Um, so give me some some dates here as far as origin. When did you initially kick things off? We initially kicked things off uh, on Kickstarter in February 2016. But I can tell you that that was a good three years in the making. So from the time that I you know decided to do this to the time that we actually launched it was three years of a lot of hard work and a lot of trial and error a lot of um you know creating creating product um creating samples uh, fixing them going back and forth to the factories just making sure that everything is perfect um and then once we decided to to even launch on kickstarter that 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 in and of itself was a year-long process of uh, creating videos figuring out how we're going to market it um and it was you know we had never done it before i'd never done that before it was something completely new that I was learning um, as I as I went, and I had never made a video before. So just making sure that uh, that we put out something that we were were proud of and happy with um, was was a very very long and time consuming process. It was Kickstarter initially part of your growth strategy? Uh, no, it wasn't actually. Okay. Um, and it, 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 you know, I knew that I wanted to create. Um, this product and I knew that I wanted to to go direct to the consumer. Um, and a lot of that had to do with my, my history in the business and having had a lot of experience going to, you know, major department stores and retailers and seeing how, how that wasn't, I didn't feel like that was going to be working so in the future. So going direct to consumer um, is what I had my, <coughs> my, uh, my mindset on. Um, but once I created the product, I, I had a great collection. I, I was really happy with it. And then I realized, you know, like, how am I going to get, uh, people to our website. How am I going to get get the name out there? How am I going to get my shoes into people's hands? Um, because I knew that that was the key. I knew that once once people saw what we made, um, we knew that we'd we'd make a we got a customer for life. We knew that they'd understand the product and they'd understand that that um, it's something really special. So you know, just going back and forth and just having conversations. Um, that's really how we ended up thinking that maybe Kickstarter or crowdfunding would be the way to go and get that, get that initial expo- exposure um, uh, fairly quickly. Yeah, yeah. And, to, and to add to what Paul mentioned too, prior to actually going on to Kickstarter, one of the things we you know we were talking about different strategies and different way to do it and whether to actually do the Kickstarter or not. And one of the big deciding factors also was um, the ability to get all this data on you know how much inventory to purchase, which you know you might have a whole collection, but which ones might be the most popular. Those are things that, you know, when you're an entrepreneurial startup and you don't have a lot of, uh, 
a lot of room to make, you know, an inventory mistake, um, that data can be, you know, make or break and can allow you to, you know, really have a, a chance at, you know, starting off with a, with a bang and, and not missing just because you, did, you didn't have the data that a lot of the other companies, these established companies have on past sales. So that's, that's something that, you know, aside from the actual just, you know, make, making revenue part of it, the data that you get from Kickstarter is invaluable. What were some of the outstanding metrics or maybe the surprising metrics that you guys figured out in that first uh, Kickstarter campaign that really maybe perhaps changed the trajectory or course of your, of your growth strategy? Yeah, absolutely. So um, a, lot, a lot of those metrics came down to, um, well, obviously, a lot aside from the, the big ones, like, you know, the, the conversion rates and, um, you know, other, other metrics about like, re, you know, retentions and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I think one of the biggest one was um, the actual inventory levels, because when, especially when you're dealing with a product like shoes, there are so many variations of a single a single product. You have one product, but you have sizes five, five and a half, all the way up to size 14. You know, For sure. Yeah. There's you know, 17 different variations. And then if you have D&E with sizes, there's another 17 variations. So and it's one of those things where you need to keep a full stock in order to be able to sell them to be able to market you know effectively you need to have at least one of everything at all times so it requires a big commitment because of the variations in shoes so that data that you get from the you know, inventory trends and size trends and how much to order of each size that is you know in a, in a high um, inventory requirement like type of business like this that that was the, the single-handedly the most important data piece of data we collected yeah so how did the first uh, Kickstarter campaign go what were the results yeah, the first Kickstarter campaign we did, um, I believe it was five hundred and seventy-four thousand dollars in forty days, which at the time was the number one shoe campaign in Kickstarter history. Yeah, and then the second Kickstarter campaign, um, I think we did about one point two six five million dollars, which again became the number one Kickstarter campaign after that. Also, yeah, and so. I think that one of the coolest things is that that not just the again not the financial part, but we in the first campaign. Uh, we gained about 2,000 backers from 60 different countries. And in that second campaign, uh, it was about a little over 4,000 backers in 80 countries. So we really quickly got exposure in lots of different countries all over the world. And and the ongoing sales on our website are reflecting that. So we constantly have orders from places that we've, we've actually never even heard of. Sometimes we have to look at the map of the world and figure out where we're getting these orders from. Wow. Okay. So let's talk about the campaign strategy. What... Um, what did you guys do? Who did you uh, maybe enlist? What were some? What what made you successful? Do you think in terms of your ability in your first Kickstarter campaign to come out with such a bang? Yeah, sure. So one of the things that we that I aim to do during uh, establishing the marketing campaign and marketing strategies was um, first is, is is establishing the difference between indirect sales and direct sales, um, and, and and channels for advertising. Um, you know, a lot of the social media um, outlets they're. They're, they can be very effective marketing tools, but a lot of times they're they're more catered towards branding. Yeah. So what we try to do is focus on more direct direct sales um, channels. So um, the ability to say, you know, this is this is what we're selling. Here it is. Here's an offer. Come over and, and check it out. And do you want to participate in this in this great um, campaign? And, and and separating those two, I think, uh, was a big difference because even because we would still dabble into some of the other like you know social medias, trying some Instagram posts, trying some influencer marketing and stuff like that, but at the end of the day, like those, those just didn't compete in the same uh, way that the other ones did, the more direct type of sales. So um, we, yeah, we, we, that, that really made a big difference as far as like keeping our campaign going. And I, and I think once we, once people started interacting with us and interacting with our campaign, I think what made a big difference is the way that we were very responsive to the customers and to the backers. Because one thing that we did learn about Kickstarter, especially in the first campaign is that that backers aren't there just to buy a product. They're there to become part of your company and to help you um, launch your company. And they really want to be able to give you feedback and free to act on that feedback. And that's that's uh, that's something that we're very responsive to and very open to and that we, we always try to implement as much of it as we can and as quickly as we can. Yeah. How do you feel? I think that, you know, common theme when we talk about Kickstarter campaigns, it's the, that initial, you were 40 days, right? And it's that initial few days to really kind of start measuring on the algorithms and getting the the real estate if you will and the exposure that comes for the you know the popular the the ones that are really standing out did you guys have any support from a firm or anybody that helped you establish that or was this a hundred percent on you guys well no i know we the we didn't actually hire any outside agencies until like halfway through the campaign where we had someone uh do some facebook uh 
some Facebook tag marketing. So in the beginning, it was all us. But one of the one of the big things that separates our campaign from a lot of the other ones is that um, we don't. Uh, in the majority of Kickstarter campaigns, you can see that most of the people that 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 purchase, they've you know, 80% of the people who, of their backers, they've purchased before on Kickstarter. Yeah. Um, ours, we had one of the, we, both of our campaigns were extremely high. I think the first one we had almost 35, 40% of the people is that was their first Kickstarter purchase. Wow. And on the second one, it was, it was, it might've been even more. I think it was about 45 to 50% where people were, that that was their first purchase. So we were actually bringing people in who had never even purchased on Kickstarter before and, you know, got them to actually purchase. So we didn't rely as heavily on actually just being, you know, positioning inside of Kickstarter, you know, for that Kickstarter uh, traffic. Yeah, especially at first. But once once we started driving traffic towards the middle of the campaign using some outside agencies, that's that's when we started popping up in that in that you know more uh, uh, that better real estate on Kickstarter featured, etc. Um, exactly. So what were, what did you leverage? I mean, this is actually really quite vindicating for. Um, I think the people that are interested in doing Kickstarter campaigns or any crowdfunding for that matter that don't have the perhaps the budgets to bring in one of these big firms that specializes in, you know, building it for you and just launching with just all of this fanfare. Um, you guys, you guys created your own. Um, what did you leverage? I mean, how did you, we're talking 2000 people that you reached and then 4,000 in the second. What is it that you guys did to connect so effectively with um, with so many even new people that weren't necessarily part of crowdfunding. Sure. Well, I mean, one of the very first things that we did is leverage our networks and extended networks. Okay. Uh, so I, I pretty much any person that I'd ever had an email communications with, I emailed and let them know about the campaign. Um, and then we set up a landing page uh, where we made it super easy for everyone that was receiving those emails to start sharing the campaign. So, so, you know, I, we'd like to think that we actually were able to reach, you know, not, not just the person that we had that, that initial contact with, but probably two or three people um, separated from them. So I think that that's what really gave us that initial ignition over the first, like, I'd say six to seven days of the campaign. And that, that really is where it took off. Okay. So let's talk about, you know, fulfilling on Kickstarter. You're selling approaching $2 million in, in backing, right? And so you've got a lot of product that you're selling. Um, what did it take for you guys to be able to fulfill on all of that growth, all of that demand? I think that's where it comes back to the experience that we've had in, in the industry. Yeah. Um, so we actually have a warehouse uh, that we operate. And the logistics part of it is something that I've been doing for a very long time. I actually started out in the warehouse uh, when I was like 14, 15 years old. So uh, setting up the the inbound logistics, outbound logistics, the you know the the pick and pack and and everything that that was required to do this fulfillment and actually even setting up a facility, a third party facility in Europe to be able to better service our international customers. Yeah. Um, it, it just came with experience, the domain experience that that I had in the business. Um, so we were able to easily set that. I mean it wasn't easy, nothing is easy, but yeah. You know, I, I pretty much knew what to do there and, and where to go and how to, how to get that done. Um, before we shift gears into kind of life after crowdfunding, um, I kind of want to go back to this early, this kind of this initial stage. We've got the three years before you launched on Kickstarter. You've got the two years and the two campaigns on Kickstarter. What were some of the big challenges that you faced in the early, in the genesis of this business? I think probably the biggest one was that realization when, when we, uh, you know, had the line done and we had the product and we had no idea how we were going to get it out there. That's kind of like, you know, when you're making a collection and you have an idea and, and you're starting and you're like, all right, just going to go make some shoes. You find the factory, you make it and you, you sample it and the product looks great. And then it's kind of like, all right, now what? Like, how, how are people going to buy this? Like, why are they going to buy my shoe over, you know, the million or one shoe, shoe option that they have at the store? Yeah. Uh, and, and that was really like the big probably like the most difficult moment um, in the beginning of this, uh, just having that big realization and trying to figure out how to, how to move forward and how to try to be successful at least. Um, where did you guys start in terms of, you know, the most likely avenues or channels of growth? The, uh, the most an honest answer to that question <laughs> is that the first thing that, that I, that I did, I mean, I, I could, th that was an extremely difficult time and mm -hmm. I, I mean, I can't even express how hard it was to come to that realization. And 
the first thing that I thought of to do was just to even figure out if I'm the only one that likes these shoes or if someone else would like, <laughs> yeah. would like these shoes is I started taking it to all my friends that, you know, that are lawyers, professionals and starting to get their opinion. But even if they would tell me that they like them, I'd kind of feel like, you know, they're, they're, they're my friends. So they're just kind of telling me that. And so then I tried to expand a little bit more and take it to some other people. And, and just to get an idea, I was really just killing time to try to figure out what I was going to do, <laughs> yeah. uh, how, how I was going to get this out there. And, you know, we, we, we built, uh, we built a, a ba- very basic website and, and, and just tried, tried to see what would happen and, and nothing really did happen. And I mean, it was, it was just a very confusing and, and very difficult time just overall. And, and then once, yeah, I think that probably the best thing that happened there is just that once the idea of actually moving forward with a crowdfunding campaign uh, kind of came into play and, you know, we were able to shift our focus onto that and, and how to, you know, figuring that whole piece of the puzzle out, it at least gave, gave some relief of, of being up against this wall. Yeah. Um, and then it just gave us something to focus on and to move forward on and, and something to keep us busy, which it did for about a year. Yeah. So you, you get to that point, Kickstarter comes into the picture. Now let's shift a little bit. Let's talk about the evolution after Kickstarter. How, how did the business change? Perspectives obviously shifted. You realize that you have something. Um, people love the shoes. They're getting behind the business. They're falling in love with the brand. Your last campaign was in March of this year? Correct, yeah. It okay. finished in March 2017. <clears throat> so let's walk through the last six months. What's happened since that campaign? Great, great question. Um, so um, it's been this, this is one of the biggest challenges that we faced outside of Kickstarter also um, with with our product and especially uh, what we're trying to do. Like there's a big shift in the market right now from people going from, you know, the way they traditionally bought things. To now there's a lot of direct to consumer brands coming into the market yeah. and uh, a lot of people are educated and they're getting familiar with what that means to be direct to consumer. But there is still this you know, notion that, that the price of a product determines the quality of a product. Yeah. And that's really hammered into people's, people's heads. So if they see, you know, a shoe at a hundred dollars, they're going to assume, you know, this isn't a good quality product or, you know, conversely, if they see a shoe at $700, oh, this must be a great quality shoe. And they use the price to judge quality. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people that still have this mentality. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to bring these $600, $700 quality um, shoes but, but at a direct-to-consumer price and being able to sell them for under $300. Now, the, the big challenge is people see you know, your shoe under $300, therefore they think you're a $300 shoe. So you know, trying to market to this, this ultra-luxury brand at, a, at an extremely affordable price, you know, there's a lot of things that you have to overcome and educate people on, which can make it very, very difficult to actually try to do marketing um, during this process. You know, During Kickstarter, people care about the story. They take time to learn. They keep time to you know, to really get to know what they're, what they're investing in. They're, they're investing in a company, not just a product on Kickstarter. Outside of that, people just want to buy a pair of shoes and, you know, you don't have a lot of time to convince them of how great the, you know, the product, the quality is. So it's, um, it's one of those dynamics that's a really big challenge to, to overcome. And that's something that we've been trying to do ever since. And, uh, you know, there's, there's different ways that we're doing it. And as direct to consumer continues to, you know, people become more and more educated on direct to consumer, um, it, it's going to keep, you know, getting better and better, but that, yeah, that's definitely one of our biggest challenges since coming off Kickstarter is getting people to understand, Hey, this is, this is a great quality shoe. And the, the fact that it's, you know, the price is where it's at is because it's direct to consumer. It's not because it's actually, you know, the, the, the costs are that much lower. Um, when you guys first did your, your, uh, your first Kickstarter campaign, you were really focused around the $200 price point and it looks like you've come, you've shifted to about 300. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, I mean the difference is really the Kickstarter price. On Kickstarter, it's about two hundred, and and outside of Kickstarter, it's two ninety five. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Kickstarter, Kickstarter grants a lot of luxuries in terms of like when you know it exactly what you're trying to order and what you have to manufacture. There's a lot of um, things that you that a lot of the ex- excesses that you don't have to account for. Like especially when like when I mentioned before about the sizing issue. You, know, you can you can sell out through half of the sizes in a single you know in a single shoe it becomes almost impossible to sell you know the rest of those shoes because your marketing costs go up and you never know if that the guy that you were paying for that click on or the, the customer that you acquired was was he a size nine and you happen to be out of it so it's almost impossible to sell a shoe if you don't have a full run on it so you know that's that's something on Kickstarter where you don't have that problem you don't have a lot of excess that you can't sell so it allows you a lot more wiggle room to, to give a lower price and lowers your costs considerably. Yeah, and you For have sure. that, that inventory risk. 
yeah. than we would otherwise. So what seems today to be the most, um, you know, efficient and scalable growth strategy for you? Um, I'm, cause just to your point, you know, your, your customer acquisition cost is probably substantially higher. Now you've got this additional risk that you're introducing relative to you know, supply. Um, where are you gravitating to what seems to be the greatest channel of growth for you now? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So one of the things that we've noticed in the beginning is that we are having a hard time educating people again, like going back to what was the quality part, right? Yeah. So we've seen, you know, a lot of on our marketing campaigns, a lower conversion than we'd like to. So we haven't been trying to invest a lot of money into big marketing campaigns at a low conversion rate because we know the ROI is not going to be there. And as a startup, we don't have the leeway to just, you know, roll out a huge branding campaign and just educate people and then you know, then, okay, eventually those conversion rates will go up because people, you know, know the brand. So we've had to have, you know, be kind of um, intuitive in the way that we've tried to educate people and the way that we've picked our spots to market and scale. So one of the, the one of the ways that we've been doing that is through organic growth. And we've been really focusing on people who are influencers in terms of educating people on where to go if they were looking for, you know, a quality product. So we, we, we've set out to make it so that if you were going to do research on the internet, you're going to find us as a great value, a great quality shoe at a great value. Yeah. And, and by doing that, we're kind of setting the, the setting this, the initial point of entry for where we're getting customers now at people who are doing research, who care about research, who care about finding quality products. So that allows us to, that, that just goes, that goes a lot better with what we're doing right now and, and allows us to acquire those customers at a higher conversion rate because they flow with that, with that narrative. And then, and then what's really important to us, it's not just that initial acquisition, but just being able to retain that customer. So we have a really big focus on making sure that the customers are happy, making sure that what, anything that comes out of our warehouse is of the quality and, and of the quality that we would expect to be expected to be and that our customers would expect from us. And just building that, that long-term relationship uh, with anyone that comes into our, into our brand, into Ace Marks. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the influencer dynamic for a minute. I mean, that seems to me one of the best ways for you to amplify or accelerate that organic growth, um, that organic awareness, right? Brand awareness. And what has that journey been like for you to find those influencers? And does that feel like it's a scalable strategy for you? Oh, absolutely. Influencers have been our number one sort, like most effective marketing, uh, marketing tool so far. I mean, I, I, I love working with influencers. I think that it's, um, it's, I think it's an undervalued tool right now and in far as, um, you know, just different marketing channels. There's a lot of great, great influencers out there who have a lot of people who, you know, they they really care what they say. You know, they they, they, they look to them for advice or, or for recommendations. recommendations. And so there and there's, a, there's a lot of potential there for just great, great um, marketing opportunities. Uh, what do you look for in a good, in an influencer? Yeah, that, that, that's a great one. So I have a little uh, algorithm that I use to determine the value of a of an influencer. It's it's kind of complicated and there's a lot of mathematics behind it, but essentially it allows me to figure out okay, how much how much of their influencers how how engaged are they? Yeah. And how much do they actually um when they when they look at this influencer or when they follow this influencer, are they doing it in a, in a in a more of a passing sense or are they doing it for actual purposes of recommendations? And we can, we can I kind of measure, I figured out a way to measure that engagement to determine what that ROI would be from that. So we use that to determine who's the right influencers and what value to actually put on the influencers as opposed to what, you know, what they think their value is and what our value, what the value would be to us. And so we can find the right influencers that, that work with that. Interesting. Okay. Um, let's talk about the five-year, the 10-year plan. What, what does this company look like and where are you guys ultimately aiming for with, with Ace Marks? So definitely over the next five years, we'd like to establish ourselves as the go-to place uh, for higher end shoes and accessories, um, as well as well as some other luxury products that we have in the works. Um, and, you know, the way that we see that the industry rolling, the, the way that we see retail transforming, um, I think that we're at a very pivotal period in time for retail. Yeah. And we really want to come out as as the number one brand for high-end luxury products and shoes and i think that over the next five to ten years that's really going to be our focus of building this business organically 
Um, and again, just really in a customer centric, customer focused type of way. So building, building these relationships with our customers. Yeah. That's definitely something that's changed a lot too. Like you can see it in the retail marketplaces. I think like in the past people would go to, you know, a department store and there would be, you know, a, a small number of brands that basically told you what, what you had to buy, right? You didn't have a lot of options. It was, you know, maybe five or six, you went to the men's department, you might've had seven, eight different, you know, brands there and you would choose between these seven, eight different brands. Mm -hmm. Now that's kind of completely changed, right? Because people don't just go to department stores to figure out what they want to wear. Now they're getting, you know, recommendations from, you know, Instagram and social media. And they're, so what you're seeing is these emergence of not, you know, eight brands that control 80% of the market, but you're seeing, you know, these uh, large, large, large numbers of brands that are a little bit smaller, that are not as big in terms of like, you know, owning the whole, the whole market share, but there, there's just, there's more players in it. And I think that that's a big dynamic of, <clears throat> of what, what's been a part of our success too, is that we're, we're kind of in, in <clears throat> engaging in that dynamic of this changing marketplace where people are, they're just shopping differently. It's just yeah. a different way, a different way that people, you know, are able to find the brands that they want to wear. And it's becoming more, more niche, right? Because there's a lot of more brands that serve a lot more different areas, you know, and for, for us, one of the big staples was actually getting into, uh, you know, like an ethical part of this too, which is our buyback program. So we, we have this buyback program that puts, um, and, and Paul can speak more detail about the buyback program, but he, um, we, we actually will buy back any old shoes that you guys, that people want, that customers want to um, give back. And we will give them to people in need that you're looking for a job interviews or trying to get back into the workforce. And that ethical part of what we do, I think that that's something that customer customers identify with something that we want to do because we, you know, we enjoy doing it, but I think that's also something that customers want to identify with and brand in, in terms of brand values. Yeah. To, yeah. And to build a little bit on what Julian said, I, I always like to say that our, our, our mission is to make luxury shoes accessible. Um, and that really, that buyback program, it kind of, adds a different level to it where it's not just making shoes accessible to people that can pay for them, but also to people that are in need and that, that need them. Uh, so we, we're trying to make them accessible at different levels. Yeah. I love it. I love that. Let's talk a little bit more about the origins of where did you feel like that was, you know, the cause or something that you wanted to do to give back and, and make a difference. I remember reading footwear news, um, somewhere around the early to mid two thousands and seeing that uh tom shoes came out and with his idea that you know it was really early in their company and and they were giving away uh one pair for every pair that they sold and i just instantly fell in love with that idea and yeah and i always said to myself that that if if i had the opportunity to to create something where where that where i can put that into play or put something similar into play and just help people out while I, while i'm building a company and building <clears throat> something uh something you know building something else um, that I would do that. And so in, in coming up with ACE marks and just thinking that our coming up with our mission and, and understanding where I really wanted to go with this and making these types of shoes accessible, um, you know, just the idea of making them accessible to people that can't afford them or that wouldn't otherwise be able to afford our shoes or, or any shoes for that matter. And being able to help those guys out, um, just seemed like a good fit and just seemed like a really exciting thing to be able to do with this project. Yeah, there's nothing like a pair of shoes to really, I mean, I, I had a junior high school principal. I've always wondered when this piece of advice would show up in a podcast, but uh, uh, Mr. Shalen, I'll never forget him. And the one thing that he always said in assemblies was, if you dress good, you feel good. Or if you dress good, you look good. If you look good, you feel good. And if you feel good, you do good. There's just something about a great looking pair of shoes that really sets a precedence in the way that you're perceived and um, and gives you confidence. It's It's awesome. I mean... So uh, kudos to, to that initiative and what you guys are doing. And I think, uh, it's just one way that we can, you know, try and create value for even the people that maybe don't have the opportunity, but need that edge that can help them gain that confidence to put themselves out there. So yeah, and co confidence is a, a huge part of what we do. And, and you can see that all over our first campaign as well. Um, giving people confidence, like you said, shoes is, is plays a huge role. Yeah. huge role in that and we're very very aware of that and that's why making a high quality product is is something that again is just very near and dear to our heart yeah, yeah. shoes shoes are one of those maker they, they can make or break an outfit they're one of those things that you can have a really great suit on but if you have a, a pair of shoes that looks old and it can really just kill the whole thing and vice versa and, and conversely you know uh an, a suit that might not be that you know over the top but a great pair of shoes can make it really stand out 
Cool. Um, let's talk about competition for just a minute. Um, I know that's probably a big part of this for you. You you are competing with those um, dynamics, but you probably do. You have some other some other analogs, some other companies that you're competing with that have a similar approach and strategy. Yeah, I mean, there's you know there's direct to consumer companies popping up uh, pretty regularly um, in in the shoe space. We have competitors that have come up over the last year. Um, and there was, there were some here that, that were around before we started as well. Um, I think that we do differentiate ourselves considerably in terms of the type of quality product that we offer. Um, especially, you know, especially at this price point, um, there's, other, there's other competitors that are a little bit less expensive, but I, I would not say that the quality is there. Um, and there's others that are more expensive. And I, and I believe that we're probably much better quality than, than okay. those guys as well. Yeah, there, there have been other people that have emailed us saying, like, what are you guys doing? You can't sell for this cheap. Like, you're ruining everything. <laughs> like, yeah, they're, they, they, they really, like, they don't like what we're doing here with, with, with the quality and the price that we're offering. You know? Exactly. <clears throat> so so we've had um, – so there's definitely other guys out there, but I think that we, we – you know, and we also, again, through the relationships that, that we've built – um, over two generations here um, with our factories and with Italy and, and with other different different parts of the world and in terms of sourcing, uh, we're really in a, in a unique position to offer just an incredible, incredible product using um, those those contacts that we have. Prior to kind of the Kickstarters, how A, did you fund the business and can you give us some idea of, of scale of kind of what that took in terms of seed capital to make this thing, to get this rocket ship off the ground? Sure. Um, prior to Kickstarter, um, everything it, I self-funded everything, um, and I think that before the campaign, we probably I probably put, I'd say about twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars into the business, um, and that really ended up being just for for travel, for creating the, the samples, uh, just going back and forth a little bit, and then that initial Kickstarter video. Um, and the mark, and not even the marketing around that, but just that initial, just creating that initial campaign is probably what it took us twenty, 20 to twenty five thousand dollars. And then, as far as the, you know, I, I'm thinking cars here right now, but like the flooring, like the inventory, um, are you able to work, you know, net terms to make that cash flow? How? Let's talk about that part because that's got to be an expensive rollout. It absolutely is. And that's why we've had extremely limited inventory um, up until about now. The yeah. second campaign um, is really what allowed us to have a little bit of extra cash flow to buy that inventory. And, and every every penny that, that's come through uh, through our account has gone right back into the business, yeah. either marketing or inventory. So are you st- do you think you found your equilibrium, your sweet spot, or are you still probably seeing that more cash would allow you to be a little bit more aggressive in growth. Yeah, absolutely. Right now we're, we're pretty much still bootstrapping it. The, the Kickstarter yeah. campaigns were great, but you know, our margins are not huge on those campaigns where we're, we're almost giving the shoes away at cost essentially yeah. just to acquire those customers. Um, but we, you know, thankfully our, our, I think that our organic growth has been pretty nice. Our Julian strategy of, of uh, making ourselves very visible when people are shopping for quality shoes has been very helpful. So even though we haven't had a lot of inventory, our inventory turnover has been has been pretty solid. So it's allowed us to continue buying more and, and growing little by little. And you're seeing repeat customers, I'm assuming, coming back as well. Absolutely. And that's yeah. one of the things that we really pride ourselves on. I mean, you know, shoes, men's dress shoes is not necessarily something that someone buys very often or reorders on a weekly or monthly basis. Yeah. Um, and considering that we've had about 30% of customers come back and, you know, and it's only been about our website hasn't even been up for about a year. Actually, I think now November is going to be one year since our website launched. So it, it's, you know, we're pretty happy with that number. That's awesome. I mean, hallmarks of product market fit, right? I mean, just the evidence that you guys are on the right track and now it's a function of finding that efficiency that it really allows you to scale and generate, you know, the, the leverage and the, the margins that can allow you to really reach that next level. So, um, do you see any interest in raising growth capital or do you feel like you are in a good position to continue to bootstrap into it? 
So we've we've been approached uh, by lots of different uh, potential investors that have been interesting interested in helping us accelerate our growth, um, and we're definitely fielding those calls and and talking to them. And it's not something that we've said. It's not. It's definitely something we're considering at the moment. So yeah. so we're we're seeing what the best options are. We just want to make sure that if we do <clears throat> do go that route, um, that it's someone that really understands our vision and, and can really get behind what we're trying to do and. And understand that this is, you know, not really a software company that we're going to get a billion users in the next mm -hmm. week or two. And then flip uh, and, it's and something sell it, that right? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's something that that we're really, you know, we really love the product, and it's something that's very special to us. We want to make sure that it, it's something that would be special to them as well. And we, yeah, we, exactly. It's not just about the, you know, getting getting. Yeah, we can have, you know, a capital injection and and you know scale this much more rapidly. But from us, it's more important. Like we rather bootstrap it. And stick and stick to you know the values that we want to implement in you know the the way the men, the shoes are manufactured you know the types of you know uh, ethical programs we 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 engage in like the buyback program like we want to stay true to those things and uh, you know sometimes that doesn't always line up with with an investor even though they're bringing you know capital and you can scale those other things sometimes don't line up so we're we're gonna be you know we're gonna we want to make sure that those things come first pr prior to just you know trying to scale fast yeah exactly. And Absolutely. getting just getting a bunch of shoes out there into the market. It's not really what we're looking for. No question. Um, so before we let you guys go, a biggest piece of advice that you would give to yourself earlier in your career or to an aspiring entrepreneur? Listen to your customer because customers because they're probably going to give you your next big idea. And, and, and it, it sounds like really simple and, and basic, but lots of people just brush it off. Um, and I think that that that's probably one of the most important things to to be doing out there. If if you're listening and understanding what's going on and seeing how people use whatever you're selling or or your products and just have have a those, having those conversations with people out in the field and out on the floor, mm -hmm. that's where your ideas are going to come from, and that's where you're going to be able to keep your company going or or build what you're trying to build. Love yeah. it. One one thing that I would add to that too is I had this I had this discussion with someone the other day that I thought was really interesting. It's that. Uh, it's learn to to study people's processes, not so much their results. Because I realized yeah, I there's that. a lot of people out there that they can, you know, they, they might have had a you know a very successful company, but that doesn't mean that the that the process that they use to get there it needs to be copied or that it was even correct. Um, so I, I think that that's a big thing too is learn learn to find a process that you believe in, that you know that you know is it will will eventually lead to success regardless of what the actual result is. You might have a great process and it might lead to failure, but it doesn't mean it was the wrong process. Yeah. So I think that that's a, that's a good, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a great tip that I would give to people. Well, one of the things that I, that I use for that in marketing is, uh, we, I have this uh, strategy where it's, um, we try, we cast a wide net on different marketing, um, channels. And what we do is we measure the success. We, 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 we put in uh, very good measuring tools for determining, you know, what, what was exactly brought in from those channels and we double down on what works and we get, we get rid of what, what doesn't. And then after a, a certain amount of time, go back and try the things that didn't work, try them again because you, what worked, you know, a year ago or what didn't work a year ago might be working now. And that's a process that, you know, that I believe in that's always going to be, you know, metric based. And I think that's allowed me to continue to find, you know, the, the right places to continue to grow and evolve and never just believe in okay this was work this is what worked for me in the past therefore that's what's going to work for me in the future i think that's a very dangerous mindset yeah i love that i mean i'm thinking of the book traction you know and your growth channels will evolve as your business evolves and you may come back to something that just didn't pan out initially so beautiful love that piece of advice um, guys, what is the best way for listeners to connect with you, find, learn more about you, um, and ultimately, um, connect with some, with some shoes? Um, obviously our website, www.acemarks.com, okay. uh, we're on all the social media channels, uh, Instagram, Acemark shoes, YouTube. Uh, we don't tweet too much, but we're on there somewhere. Uh, mm -hmm. Facebook as well. The gram. Yeah. <laughs> the, yeah, the, gram. A big one. <laughs> the gram and um you know and you can go to our kickstarter campaigns and there's follow buttons on kickstarter now so whenever we launch something new or whenever we actually back another project and we usually we we back quite a few kickstarter projects that we believe in and other founders that we may know and we try to support um so you'll get notifications uh about anything that we're doing on there as well cool um real quick the name ace marks <laughs> <That's fastball. laughs> I was asked this question earlier today, actually. 
And um, I, I wish I had an amazing story, but <laughs> uh, but I don't have a great story for that. Um, I was told I need to get, I need to figure one out. But it, it really, I knew that I wanted a, a strong masculine American name, and preferably one that started with the letter A. Um, and just putting combinations of names together, um, Ace Marks was the only one that I could find the URL for because I didn't want it to be like. Paul Farrago shoes or, or anything like that. I want. I, that's funny because I told him I'm like Paul Farrago is actually a great name for. Totally, Russian. yeah. But it sounds too much like Ferragamo. I didn't want people to think we we're like the cheap Chinese ripoff or something. No, I love so, it. I love it. You just need to come up with a really good poker story, like you had bet your <laughs> house and your the farm, and you came up with an ace that uh, ultimately was the seed capital for your shoe company. Oh, that's a great story. <laughs> there you go. You're welcome. <laughs> no, we definitely have to come up, have to come up with something better than that. But, <laughs> but, but that's the reality. That's, that's the real story. Cool. I love it. All right. Well, guys, um, listen, love the shoes. I mean, the attention to detail, everyone needs to quickly go watch your crowdfunding campaign. You know, I'm, I'm not a shoe connoisseur by any stretch of the imagination, but I do enjoy shoes. And I think that you guys have developed a brilliant product. And thank you for taking some time to walk us through your business, to join us on the show and to give us some perspective of uh, the direction that you guys are headed. It's been great to have you. Excellent. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having us on. Yeah, cool. thank you. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you for listening to Sales Founders and a special thanks to Paul and Julian for joining us on this week's episode. Uh, to connect with Ace Marks, connect with us on salesfounders.com where you can find the show notes for this episode as well as past episodes. We also encourage you to subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already and share out episodes with entrepreneurs and founders in your network. So um, we appreciate your continued support. We'll be back next week with Steve Noodleberg. We're going to be talking about a deep dive into salesmanship and some of the strategies that can help you as a founder. So until then, we appreciate your support. We appreciate you tuning in each week and we'll talk to you next week on Sales Founders. Thanks for listening.